well, welcome back everybody and to another structured note for March. And today we're going to be running through an interesting note. It's the, the issue at this time is a little different. It's BMP Paribas. And we're going to have quite an in-depth thing, especially, you know, so much has changed. The last time we spoke, we weren't at war. Now we have war. It's quite an interesting thing. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is just let Andrew pick up and just again to confirm this is for information only, and we do not give advice, and we do encourage you to always do your own research before making any decisions. So, Andrew, would you like to pick it up? Thanks, Joe. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to Cape Town. How's it, Graham? Um, hi, uh, Andrew. Graham has, Graham has introduced himself, but uh, he and I are particularly, I'd like to say, proud of this particular note. Yeah. Um, if you look at the screen, it's got it's, it's a fairly iconic bridge, but um, it also is quite unusual in terms of the actual composition of the note. And if you look at the bottom right hand corner, you'll see a little star. Then it says Sharia compliant. Now that is the it basically means that this particular note has been given a stamp of approval by the cultural um, Islamic. Um, uh, team at BNP Paribas who structured this note with us and effectively um, Muslim clients who want to invent, invest, shall I say, um, have now got an approved product in which to, um, in which to invest. You don't see these a lot. Um, they're very, very strict parameters, but we're delighted that it's of a nature because this note was actually developed with certain clients in mind. We were asked to develop something along those lines about a year ago. Um, and it's now suddenly come very much onto the front burner, so much so that we could actually hedge the actual note. But saying that this note is available to, to everybody, to all investors, it just happens to tick the particular boxes that are required for that particular uh, cultural uh, regulations. It's a absolutely stonking profit. Um, if you look at there, the profit or income that would be paid. We use the word profit because income is not recognized, uh, interest income is not recognized by, by that culture. But let's call it quarterly profit, we call it quarterly income, 4.27%. Now, I think Graham can correct me, but I think when we priced it last year, um, we got a, a percentage number that was pared down from that. So we were delighted, given that the world has, as I mentioned, moved on into a fairly dangerous space, which we'll cover, and not too much yet, because I think everybody's got an overload of this. Uh, but certainly to give our view in terms of where does this fit and why does it fit at this particular time. So this note was, as we mentioned, it was put into play. It was put onto a, a sort of creative thinking platform about a year ago. And it's, it's now come to the boil. We've hedged around about $1.7 million, um, which is a reasonable amount. Quite a bit of that is probably spoken for in terms of some of those self-set clients who were interested in this particular note with the with a certification from from BNP Paribas you can see the top right hand corner and we'll go through the fact sheet 30th of March so like all notes we have the inventory I mentioned 1.7 odd million dollars available or the 30th of March uh, whichever comes first we'll see the end of the subscription period for the the actual note um, it's one of those things um, it's available it's, it's it's not a sales pitch it's simply that's the nature of the contract this is a slide we, we put up actually in the, the bank's note, which is a very different note to this one in terms of very defensive, taking advantage of perhaps high volatility and interest rates and inflation, et cetera. But the same stresses, it's quite a dynamic, although it's negative, it's quite a dynamic negative type of slide in terms of all these particular stresses and strains are impacting us on a daily basis. Um, you know, probably when we first did this, the slide about three, four weeks ago, as you mentioned, we, the world was on the, on the brink of what was now becoming a full-blown conflict, global conflict, really. Um, and certainly it appeared in the bottom right-hand corner. And I see on the in the middle right at about three o'clock, opposite, now says Ukraine and NATO sanctions. These are all new issues, food security, issues that are coming in. So these are, the these are not the tailwinds that we experienced in 2021, these are actual headwinds that has caused you and me, fund managers, economists, politicians to basically recalibrate 
their risk dimension and their appetite for risk in terms of what is going to happen. Because up until this war, which has really overtaken pretty much all events, um, Boris Johnson must be thinking, boy, that was a get out of jail card free when he was under the whip. And maybe he still will be. <laughs> and I'm making light of it. But there, there were a lot of issues. I mean, people hardly even talk about COVID anymore. You know, COVID was on the decline into an endemic as opposed to a pandemic. It's written right across the screen there. But things were changing. So what we face now with is the, is the Russian bear. Um, this war that has really cast a shadow, not just over Eastern Europe, but over the, the, entire, the entire globe. Um, essentially because the globe politically and economically is linked very much like the internet hearts it's creative a village mentality the world really is reliant we're reliant on each other for whether it be energy whether it be food uh, whether it be communications uh, payment systems banking systems you name it we are connected and it's a very yeah, it's, a, it's a very very complicated um, situation i'm not going to make too much comment about it the bottom line is that um we need to see and approach this is, is the glass, glass half empty or is it half full? So, you know, typically in this particular shot, you see the big, angry, nasty Russian bear. And if you can screen, zoom in, you see this little Lego piece, which is, um, you know, in, in blue and yellow, the traditional Ukrainian colors. And it's about to step onto it. And I think that's effectively what happened. I think Russia did believe that Ukraine was going to roll over quite quickly. Its leadership would disappear. They'd install a puppet government. And pretty much Crimea part two would take place. And I don't know the age groups of everybody. You know, everybody's had children. I certainly have. And when they were kids, they used to let Lego lying around. And when you stood on it, it was, it was a little bit of an ouch. Um, didn't make you fall over and scream with pain unless you're a soccer player in England, but um, <laughs> certainly, certainly it um, it was an arch, and I think that's what's happened. Uh, the Russian blitzkrieg, as they wanted to perhaps have, hasn't happened. It's turning into a nasty war. There's conflict in Putin's back garden. The oligarchs are not going to sit quietly forever. Uh, there's, there's quite a school of thought thinking, well, they're not going to be too happy with all their cash being seized and their super yachts and planes, what have you. So it sounds a little bit glib on the outside, but there's massive human suffering. There's a massive movement of people, two million odd, I have now moved. Um, Cold War Part Two is pretty much what we're facing. You know, we're in a war situation. And the big problem here is that there's a guy with a big red button and he's always leaving that on the table as, as, as one of the options. So it, it is a problem. Um, and I think out of that problem, we have to look for companies and sectors and areas where this world tension that's running through the current risk it is not normal. Uh, many of us have not been a world war, a European world war. Um, and certainly we will be looking for those sectors, those companies that have absolutely, and I'll read it, superior efficiency, balance sheet strength, and earning stability. And if we can just stay on that slide for a second, Cashbox has a mantra in terms of when we deal with IDAT and the investment banks, we always look for companies that have got absolute, um, absolutely solid, stable balance sheets in terms of their ratings, in terms of their orders, in terms of who they are, where they, where they fit into their sectors. Uh, are they leaders? Are they followers? Are they peer strength? Um, how strong is their leadership team? These are the sort of metrics that, that we start looking at in terms of would they be suitable in a basket that, that we would like to use as a reference uh, investment basket? And would that basket be attractive to the underwriting bank, in this case, BNP Paribas, who would like to get their hands using your money on those options at, at pretty reasonable prices, paying a, a premium for it initially, but then obviously realizing the strength of exercising that option when it calls. So it's not just ourselves looking myopically at a number of companies that you know you have starstruck ability. We look together with the, the, the bank and, if, and certainly with the investment bank, BNP Paribas. Um, I've done quite a lot of research on, on them in terms of their in terms of their peer ratings. They're one of the top 10 investment banks in the world. They're in the top 10. Um, you know, there's, there's hundreds of um, investment banks 
IDAD, for example, keep a active watch, a quantitative and qualitative watch on probably 30 banks, Graham. Mm, uh, but yeah. certainly BNP is right up there in the top 10 in the sort of premier league. So we were delighted um, when Graham came back and said, look, we've, um, we've spoken, we've arm wrestled with, uh, with BNP Paris, and they are very happy to include in the basket the, the, the shares, the companies that we have included. Um, so maybe if we can move on there, um, Jill, if you're driving. So I can't claim this is an African slide because we don't have tigers, maybe in captivity, but sort of it, it gives you a, uh, a feeling of the size and dominance or you know, the position and dominance maybe of these three companies that we're going to present. There's only three companies, there's not four, we usually have a basket of four. There's nothing untoward in that. It's just that the particular mix with BNP and in terms of the coupon shape, the payoffs, the protection levels, these three gel together very, very well. Um, the animals in themselves have no rel relativity to, to the actual companies. It's simply dominance and position. Um, and we're going to drill into the three companies and spend a little bit more time on one of them specifically. So. We've got two that are very, very similar to each other. This is the one, this is um, AMD, um, an American company, as you can read there, I, I'm, 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 I'll just, you can paraphrase off. But uh, the next company as well is NVIDIA. You can stay on the shift, you can stay on the slide for the moment. But that's a little bit like having Coke and Pepsi in your same shopping trolley. And people might say, well, aren't you over conflict? Aren't you over um, exposing yourself in one particular area? And I would say, no. To have Coke and Pepsi is a bit like betting on black and white, especially when you are market segment leaders, where you've got the um, you've got that position and dominance per the previous slide. Now AMD, as you can see, and Nvidia are fairly new companies in terms of um, you know their longevity. AMD started in 1969. It's the smallest of the three that are in the basket. It's got a market cap of you know less than 168 billion. It sounds trite the way I say it, but 168 billion is a fairly large balance sheet. And I think what's important, and this is where the quality and qualitative and quantitative work goes into choosing the right type of companies, um, making sure that they do correlate, and in some instances not correlate to each other in the basket. But let's just have a look at some of the metrics that we look at. Um, we have said that size doesn't always count, but often it does. And in the market conditions, all those stresses we're talking about, um, it's a pretty good idea to have a balance sheet that can you know, sustain itself in times of, let's say, interest rate increases, inflation, um, the tapering of the fiscus across the world, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to be a heavyweight. Revenue last year, and these are all last year's figures for the fiscal year reporting 21, they had revenue of $16.48 billion, okay? Operating income was 1.1 billion. So just for the folk who just like a bit of an understanding, operating income is generally what's included in there is your cost of sales, whatever you're selling, manufacturing costs, and your operational expenses, your, your head count, your staff, your, all that kind of good stuff. So they made out 1.1 billion um, for a pretty young company. Um, and that was for last year. Now, last year was obviously a year where growth stocks, tech stocks, were still riding on the tailwinds of, um, of 2020. And 2020 was, I always call it the rubber band recovery. And if we have a look at the next particular share um, of NVIDIA, which is literally, you know, that's the Coke and Pepsi. This is maybe the Coca-Cola because it's the biggest company. You can see the market cap is, you know, just shy of 534 billion. It's, it's a serious company. Again, relatively new, founded in 1993. You can see its revenues and operating income. Um, you know, pretty impressive in terms of the numbers, the metrics. Um, you know, 7.1 billion and operating income of 2.7. So after cost, expensive cost of sales, the whole catastrophe. And that's often used, a lot of analysts prefer to use operating income as the, the favorite metric for profitability of a business. Uh, so in that instance, NVIDIA did a 91% year-on-year growth versus the, the previous year of 2020, where it really was in the lead uh, arrowhead 
of the recovery and the tech space of, 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 of 2020. I'll show you something interesting when we come onto it and some slides later in terms of um, you know, some of the companies, how they're really peaked during that period, how some of them have carried on and some, or one of them particularly we're gonna deal with next has gone back to almost its pre-IPO. So these are growth and growth, these are out and out growth shares. PayPal is really interesting. This is the third company. This is the tiger, the, the lion or the cheetah, or the leopard, I'm not quite sure, of those particular three. Um, it's not in the same space. It's not in the semiconductor uh, microprocessor cloud space. It's an online mobile payment system. Also, only founded in 1998. It's also got you know fairly impressive market cap um, revenues in 2022, last year, ending in December, $25.3 billion. They did over a trillion dollars. Coming off 21, they did over a trillion dollars of payment processing, which is quite substantial. So they're in the same space as your Visa, MasterCard, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is a company that's having to operate in a space where consumer spending will be impacted. You know, I've, I've, I need to stick with my mantra that the war is overshadowing everything, this conflict. But we've still got in the background, and it's not going to go away, the fact that interest rates and inflation and the money supply is, is tightening. The previous two companies also had something separate that they had to wrestle with, and that's called supply chain blockages. I was going to put up a really cool um, image of the Port of Los Angeles with these hundreds of bulk carriers and terminal carriers that are just sitting out there. They're operating 24 hours to try and clear the blockage. Um, because obviously a lot of these components, whether it's microprocessors, semiconductors, bits of car, bits of computer, bits of houses, whatever, is in a blockage situation. At the moment. They are busy untangling the, the mess. So those two companies will take benefit. But PayPal obviously realizes that there's going to be some stresses and strains coming through. And we would suggest, and this is where we're going to dive a little bit more into PayPal, because the other two are the darlings at the moment. They have been for the last two years, and they're probably going to remain so. You know, if I look at the, the Bloomberg's analyst report at the moment, and they can change quite quickly, but it's been fairly consistent. Um, the Bloomberg's is basically the side sell analyst in terms of where do they see these three shares in 12 months time pricing wise, is it a current buy, is it a hold, is it a sell, and consistently across all three, the analysts are not seeing that these companies will be below uh, their current pricing at the end of the year, there might be some dips, a bigger pardon at the end of 12 months, there might be some dips along the line because nothing is linear, nothing moves in a straight line, there's always ups and downs, but certainly the value of all these three shares at the moment, there is discount to be had. And therein comes my, and I don't use it lightly because there's a lot of pain and suffering going on, not just financially, but in, in, in people's lives, is that is the glass half empty or half full? And we would suggest that with these discounts on offer, we can now access great, great companies with great leadership teams, with great vision, with great operating revenues, getting their price, getting them into our basket at a lower price. And we're not the only ones. The investment bank would not underwrite this and a charity. They would not underwrite this if they believe they're going to have to pay these type of uh, coupons for longer, for more than they have to. In other words, they want to get out as quickly as possible and we'll take that through that. And Chad's got um, a slide each pretty much shows us all the time, which is it's good to have a look at. So let's have a gander at, at PayPal's. So we all know what it is. It's electronic payments. They've recently said, yet to the Russians, they've pulled out of there in line with Visa and, 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 and the MasterCard. It is going to affect their bottom line at some point um, because a lot of business gets done you know, through, through the Eastern Europe block. But it's the right, it was probably the right thing to do. It's market capitalization. We've had a look at it there. Annual revenues, the numbers, the net operating. I think what's more important is let's, why, are we, why is the bank keen on having this? Let's have a look under the hood. And there is a rationale that's on our website that delves into a little bit more uh, depth in terms of um, you know, the value and the position of these stocks. But we believe that PayPal is probably transitioning from a growth to a value stock. Um, certainly pre-pandemic, and there's a slide to show this, we probably back to just a little bit over its, once well, so it's IPO, its initial price offering when it listed, but certainly uh, we back to pre-pandemic sort of late in 2019 prices. And you know, we'll, we'll show you where the peak was. So it's probably in a value situation. Um, in February this year, 
management came out and they said, guys, we are not going to have the type of earnings that one trillion payments, total payment system that I said, uh, uh, payments by value that I mentioned, we're not going to have that in 2022. Things are going to, you know, come off. Um, we aren't expecting the type of um, earnings uh, at, at beginning of 2022, that's at 18%. You can see their revenue stay at 15 to 16%. So people started dumping this. I think it was the 3rd of February, they had their worst day ever in terms of people selling their share. But that got the bank looking and saying, whoa, hold on a second. This is an aberration because there's nothing wrong intrinsically. We're all operating in the same bubble. People were just looking for better value and they decided no, they were going to leave. 15 to 16%. Earnings, revenue stair is, is not bad. Yes, it's down on the previous year, but we all know inflation, interest rates, money supply is ending. It's the same for the banks. It's the same for all the processing areas. Um, I think what's important is what are they doing with their business? It's all very well buying it at a discount um, because they were seen as a, a high-tech stock, a valued stock. They, they were loftily valued. You know, they, they went from a high of 310. They're currently 92 as of like five minutes ago before we started, a high PE of 75, mirroring what your Teslas, what your, uh, all the high tech stocks, Apple's, Google's, Facebook's. And it's now coming down to a far more reasonable palatable 27%. This is what the bank's looking at. This is what, it's, this is what appetite it prefers. And I think what's important is I actually listened to a webinar with their, their CEO. It was an old webinar, I just went on to the recording. They're taking a, an interesting approach you know, last year they added 48.9 million new accounts. Okay, so let's call it 49 million new accounts. That's a lot of accounts. It took their total membership or total user base to 426 million people. Okay. And in that steer that they gave in February where people started dumping them, they said, we're only going to try and add another 20 million. And the reason for that is that they said they want to deepen the relationship that they have with the existing clients to add better value, to add better costings, to add better satisfaction to new clients, as opposed to just willy nilly bringing on as many clients as possible to almost plug um, what, the, what, what, uh, what, what was needed, uh, perceived to be needed. So it's a deepening of the relationship versus let's say, let's go mass, mass, mass. It's a, it's a, it's a problem that a lot of companies are struggling with um zoom for example and i've used them before they, they they've got a massive free participants base they need to convert that to um subscribers where people actually pay for their services but let's have a look at now um the slide um as you can see it's the three the three shares there um nothing too fancy about this um i actually took this off my phone and I sent them to Joel and I said, dicky them up, make them look wonderful. And she said, can't we just show them? I said, you know what? It's fine because therein lies the reality of what's happening to us on a daily basis. You can read essentially, you know, what is going on. Bottom right hand, bottom left hand corner, you know, Russia, Ukraine. This was, this was as of yesterday. Markets, uh, market checks and, uh, you yeah, know, suspending services in Russia. But look at the first two. They almost look identical. Okay, obviously different sizes of companies, but they operate in very much the same space. There's your Coke and Pepsi. Okay, they've both come off in terms of they've had the supply blockage issues, they've had other other functional issues, but in terms of their order books, absolutely flat out. Okay, actually another company that actually mirrors this a little bit is Tesla. Funnily enough, and I, I saw the price of nickel has gone through the absolute roof. Gold went through two thousand today. Nickel is absolutely going crazy, and that's one of the prime components of. Of, of lithium ion and nickel batteries for the electric market. And they're also having the supply uh, problems with semiconductors, et cetera, et cetera. All the automotive guys are having it. But let's, you know, we've spent a bit of the time under the hood of PayPal. Let's have a look at them. Uh, similar kind of histograph. It's bubbling along 2020, the pandemic, the virus arrives, online payments become the way to go. You're not allowed to go out, you're not allowed to shop. Everything becomes digitized, electronic. And boom, earnings go through the roof right up to, you know, the, as I say, the end of 2021 when it was absolutely 1 trillion value sales. Stunning record, never been that high. And since then, we've seen this like huge, massive reduction back to, as I mentioned, almost pre-pandemic. But 
if one looks at the metrics, if one looks at those revenues that I mentioned, if I looked at what those operating expenses and those profits are in terms of your net income, this is still a very strong company. Yes, it's cut its ties with um, Russia. Probably most of, you know, most of corporate America is doing this in one way or another. I'm talking about American companies, this is a US tech basket. But certainly banks such as BNP Paribas will look at this and say, this is a highly established sector, the dominance, the position, those, those wild animals sitting there. And it's got a great leadership team, very settled. They've got a good vision in terms of what they're going to do to deepen their revenues even further, cut operating expenses uh, and cost of sales. And that line downwards at a point will have to change. Um, they believe that they've given this you know, a period of time. It's got a, a contract will go through the actual term, the maximum term. And they're prepared to pay because it's not their money. They haven't borrowed from the central bank. They're using your money um, to basically leverage that. And when they exercise those options, they obviously will pick up any dividends. They'll pick up the growth and they'll sit on that and then on flog it to whoever they're going to sell it to. So that is the transition we believe. If you look at the other two charts, they're still very lofty. Their PEs are high. Their valuations are high. Pretty much flying along in that space still. Um, what PayPal offers is more value proposition of it's going to take a little bit of time to turn it around. And in that time, we're going to pick up some really nice coupons. We can only access the value in this particular investment basket in this note after 12 months. So it's a, it's a, uh, you know, we, we're, going to, we're going to sit on this and, and, and see what happens. Am I getting this right? Uh, yes, I um, So I had a presentation on another one this afternoon. Um, yeah, no, this is, so this is quarterly coupon. So the first coupon, if we want to go to the next slide, Jill. Just, Andrew, before we move on, there was mm -hmm. actually a comment on the chat um, basically saying, hi, everyone, read this morning that the largest manufacturer, manufacturer processor of neon gas, which is used in microchips, is in the Ukraine. Disruption of supply of neon gas may cause significant disruptions in the production of microchips used in cars and computers. So that's, you know, that's the thing that's going to have an impact. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. We, I think the world is, is realizing that um, this place called Ukraine, stroke Russia, stroke uh, that whole Eastern European area um, is, is absolutely, it's really interesting from the point of view of what comes out of there. Uh, some of the biggest aluminium or aluminum plants, as the states would call it, are based there. Um, Kiviv, which is the capital, is almost like a small Silicon Valley. It's got some of the highest tech um, concentration of tech developers in that city. Um, interestingly enough, I heard, a, um, I heard a discussion about an international hacking group they're known as Anonymous.com. And these guys have basically said, you know, in solidarity with our tech brothers in Kiviv, which is this, this, the capital under siege, is that we're going to try and disrupt and hack everything Russian. Um, and they, they, they've, they've pretty much gone about doing this with, with great glee and gusto. Um, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but, um, you know, I didn't know it was such a tech space. The amount of wheat, the amount of grain, energy that comes out of the Ukraine, and yeah, certainly nickel, um, argon gas, it's, it's going to cause more supply chain blockages um, and it's going to cause a problem. That's an interesting question because I saw executive comment by NVIDIA. I haven't seen it on PayPal because they've been asked these questions. The levels of inventory that they do have, they believe that they're not going to be immediately. And that's the question. What's, what's the definition of the word immediately? We've all got a different, we've all got a different length of piece of string. But apparently there are reserves, but at a point in time, if it's interrupted or constrained for you know, a period of time that produces production, well, then certainly it's, it's a knock-on effect into the auto industry, into the computer industry, the cloud industry, you name it. Um, but good question. Thank you. Let's have a quick look at the, um, at the sort of key metrics. Uh, BNP Paribas, um, and I'm happy for Graham to jump in at any point. It's a... Fantastic bank is underwritten. The guarantor is BNP Paribas Paris. This is actually issued out of the investment arm, which is Islamic. It has to come out of there for that particular cultural group, but its guarantor is BNP Paribas of Paris. Um, it's a 4.27 per coupon 
over per quarter coupon paid. It's got a maximum term of four years, so it can't go longer, um, but it could actually mature from 12 months. In other words, the or famous order call. And the order call level has been set at 100% of start value. So if in 12 months time, those three shares are equivalent to or equal to, uh, equivalent to or greater than their starting price, then it will end with the final payment and your funds will be returned to you. Um, if it doesn't at that point in time, then it's quarterly observations thereafter. So lots of liquidity events, lots of get out of jail, as I call it, free, free money for the, or free cards for the bank to exit. They don't want to be in here forever. Um, we've had a look at the, the companies. If I just go up a bit, if you just cursor up the 75%, to get this very fizzy, frothy coupon, because these coupons are simply haven't been available. Graham can attest to that, maybe you'd like to chip in. But mm. to, to supply this type of a level of return of payoff, we had to, if I can call it, give something up. And giving up was the, um, the, the, there's two places we gave up. One was the degradation in terms of the income trigger. Normally we like to have it down to 50, 60 or 50%. So we like to have you know, very deep levels of degradation. And the same for the final the final observation date on capital maturity. We've normally gone for 50%. So as long as the three shares are above 50% at the end and Chaz will reinforce this with the slide, this instance, it's 65%. So still deep levels, 35% for capital protection if we go that far. Mm -hmm. And certainly to just trigger that, as long as they don't fall more than 25%, um, you know, at each observation, then we're, we're home, home free for the, for the, um, for the income. Graham, I don't absolutely. know if you want to comment on this because yeah, it, it is a, it, absolutely. it's playing absolutely. with the shape of the product. Yeah. It is, it is, Andrew. And, uh, you know, you're, you're absolutely uh, spot on. The, um, you know, it is, a, it is a plate spinning exercise, quite frankly, uh, ladies and gents. It's, um, you know, we, we uh, in IDAD, um, it, we're, we're constantly spinning the ice with regards to the parameters of the shape of the note. Um, uh, Andrew's absolutely uh, spot on. It's a question of the, of the um, you know the trigger the 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 income albeit profit uh, with this Sharia compliant note um, the the capital preservation the basket um, everything is a spinning plate is effectively a, a, a an element of keeping everything at the best we possibly can to maximize the best shape for the end investor for you um, and and working with Cashbox we. You know, Andrew. Andrew mentioned about the idea of um, you know looking at this at the beginning of last year, and 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 I was very excited by it because they're actually this as a consequence of Cashbox. Really, this is the first Sharia note that IDAD has launched. We've looked at it over several years. Um, we've nearly brought it to the line, but but now um, in in conjunction with Cashbox, um, we've we've done this. And and the idea of actually maximizing that coupon as Andrew mentioned, is very much a play um, between the, 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 the actual uh, payment trigger, the profit trigger, the, uh, the, the, the underlying baskets and the capital preservation barrier. Now, Cashbox are incredibly conservative and rightly so because um, it's protecting people's well-earned money, um, hard-earned money. But, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've looked at the underlying basket and Andrew's delved into that in a, in a very, very professional manner. Um, the idea of two uh, two uh, chip companies effectively and or IT companies and then a, a payment company, um, we've had to make sure that the balance is right at the same time as maximizing that coupon return. And to deliver that 17.08% per annum, um, mm. we were just blown away with. Um, you know, I mean, when Andrew and I were talking about it, looking at it, shaping it, um, I, I, I actually said to him, I said, never, ever second guess an investment bank, because I was convinced that we wouldn't get the coupon level that we, we were looking to strike in the early part of last year. And yet here we are, probably about um, three, four, four and a half percent higher per annum than we were achieving at the beginning of last year. So it's, it's quite phenomenal. And the fact as you know, with with obviously unbelievable amount of sincere regret that we are in the situation in the world that we are now, to have that level of per annum return is is just 
uh, incredible. It really is. Um, you know, I'll just touch a little bit uh, where Andrew mentioned about the, um, you know, the, the, the underlying basket, the, the stocks that we've used. Um, you know, when you think that Taiwan really produces the bulk of the chips that are utilized in the world in all the various sectors, it's, it's even more interesting in the sense that we've got AMD and NVIDIA who are US businesses and the Americans have openly stated that they do not want to rely so heavily on chips being produced out of Taiwan. So, so, they, so it's all very well for the Taiwanese to be producing these, uh, these, these uh, uh, bits and pieces, these chips for the world. Um, but the Americans, again, you know, rightly or wrongly, are looking at protecting themselves um, in the first instance, and they're looking at protecting their businesses. So, so the, real, the real trick here is that we've identified three stocks um, that, that really do deliver. And, and, and I just, just quickly, nobody wants to catch a falling stone. Um, you know, if, if we felt that AMD was, um, you know, was going to plummet and NVIDIA was going to plummet or PayPal was going to plummet, then we wouldn't be putting them in the basket. Um, nobody wants to catch a falling stone. As Andrew's eloquently oh. said, we've, we've, we have a position here over a four year term um, whereby we, we are absolutely in reverse. There is, there is every, every possibility that after 12 months, actually the investment will mature um, um, because the observation, mm. the first observation will be, will be looked at and uh, will be at 100% or, or, or more. So it's, it's a very exciting position to be in and um, the, the due diligence and the processes that we've taken on board with this, particularly as Andrew mentioned with the issuer as well, BNP, um, you know, the acid test of any credit worthiness of a, of a bank and an investment bank is actually how much it costs to insure your money that's with them. And, um, and we do that in IDAD. You know, the, the, the uh, credit rating agencies are incredibly important, but we all know they didn't get it right in the, uh, uh, during the credit crunch. And, um, and so therefore we go to the Lloyds of London to look at how much it would actually cost, what the premium levels are to ensure oh. your money with that investment bank. And uh, BNP, absolutely top notch. Um, the premiums are not that expensive because it is such a robust and capitalized investment bank. Um, so yeah, absolutely, Andrew. Concurring with your thoughts. Yeah. Graham? Well, thanks, Graham. So, Graham, there's just been a question. Um, Runs asked, how come Adet hasn't done Sharia before? Uh, well, the reason we haven't done it before is because that we um, we actually that there are quite um, high levels of uh, of um, committed monies that are required to to enter into a, a Sharia note. Um, you know, we, we could have gone with a lesser investment bank, um, but quite frankly, the credentials are no way as, 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 uh, as, as high as BNP Paribas. And, and, and BNP have a high level um, of requirement for hedging to actually um, engage the contract, to launch the contract for the investment note. Um, and so therefore, we've, we've, we've never really felt um, that comfortable in, in committing to you know, to, to actually getting over the line. I think now with um, a set of circumstances that have come into play in, in, in dealing with cash box, um, we feel now is the time and we're very, very excited by it. Cool. Right, on screen, the, the usual fact sheet, um, as Graham pointed out, the, the guarantor is, I always say to people, who are you dealing with? That's obviously a credit risk. Um, they're issuing it off their balance sheet. Um, in other words, they have to pass the you know the tier one level investment bank ratings. Um, as Graham says they're all ticked off there with the Fitch Moody's and S and P, but we do our own qualitative um, investigations in terms of you know what's it going to cost. Does it all match up? It's a four year term, as I mentioned. So if if it didn't call, it would run to four years. So happy days in terms of the coupons that would be paid. Um, it has got a memory feature. Chad will go through that. Uh, most of you will know what that is. Uh, the first observation is at 12 months. So that's on the 30th of March um, next year. Uh, that means you could actually be having your full cash return to you or full investment return to you plus the final coupon. Um, the key information on the right-hand side is quite important. Uh, we open, as I mentioned, to the 29th of March. 
or if the, the allocation that we've uh, got, the inventory that we have, 1.7 million, is if that's exhausted before that time. Um, strike date means the, that's, the issue, that's the date that the prices actually get, uh, that the shares actually get valued. So that becomes their reference value going forward off each observation. And it kicks off on the 6th of April. So not that far away. Um, and if we can just go to the next slide, it'll show you your, your basically your schedule of payments. Um, there you go. Um, pretty much going right the way through from your first observation on the 30th of June, right the way through to conclusion. You'll see on the far right hand side, your triggers remain the same. It's a contract it's set in stone. So your income triggers stay the same as do your auto call triggers. Um, that's what we like about uh, structured notes. It gives you definition of return. It gives you predictability because there's a contract in terms of when these have to be observed and paid if the terms and conditions are satisfied. And there's a term period, a contract. It gives you, um, you know, not just an open-ended vehicle that just runs willy-nilly with the markets. I think at this point, Chad, I think the next one, the next slide is relative to the, 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 the traditional curve. Um, you could probably do this with your eyes closed now, but I think it's always good just to go back, look in the rear view mirror and to say, how does it work? Let me just refresh. Um, I, I often look at this and just say, right, just regenerate the brain cells. Chad, over to you. All right. Good stuff. I'm going to close my eyes now. Um, <laughs> so, folks, we're going to start at the top row. Um, we understand that this is a maximum four-year product. So we're going to have the quarterly uh, observations as, as always. The coupons are slightly higher than what's been indicated here. So apologies, we, we, we changed that now. But let's look at these levels. We're going to start off with these stocks at the end of March that are probably below where the market um, may or should be, which is great. Because remember, we always start at that strike value. So even with the lower start value, we've got this built-in protection, the green line, and the green line is set at 75. So again, even if those shares at their start value were to drop by 25% to the 75% of their start price, we're still in the money, the coupons will flow or the profits will pay out. And um, those obviously go straight back to our investment uh, platforms, our online platforms. The memory feature is built in. So should the stocks drop below or a stock drop below the 75% um, mark, remember, we, we don't worry because the coupon may be put on hold for that period of time or for that particular quarter. But as soon as the, the stock then gets back over the 75 mark, of course, it's going to look back, pay out any missed coupons and the coupon that's due right now. And then as Graham said, if we go a little bit further along in the life cycle of the product, the stocks need only travel at their start price. And within one year, once all four are at or above the start price, the bank will call the product back. They see great opportunity at that point now to go and convert this into profit for themselves. Enough profit to cover the cost of the borrowed money from us and to return a profit to the bank. Obviously, our funds come back to us at that point in time. Now, across the last five years, 100% of all the products that have been structured um, with IDAD, with, with Cashbox, have all auto-called as designed before final maturity. Let's go back now and look at the last level of protection. That's the gold line in the 65 uh, level. And moving all the way to the end, the product is capital guaranteed for the life of the product. However, at the very last observation, we've got this extra level of protection built in, the capital protection barrier. The lowest share need drop more than 35% uh, before any of our capital would be at risk. So let's say, example say, the last one closed out at maybe lost uh, 40%, so it's closing out at 60% of its start price. Unfortunately, at that point, it's as if we were in the market directly with that stock, we would get 60% of our capital out. So it's very important to stress, this has not happened in the last five years, but it is contracted in, and it's the last level of protection that's built in. So ideally, we want these always to auto call. And as Graham and Andrew say, the projections are, the feelings are, you know, this, this probably would not run to full term, it'll pay out earlier. <laughs> and the only thing then, 
we're going to start to lose that 17% per, per annum is the only downside. Um, if anybody wants deeper training, more understanding on this, um, please reach out to us. We'd love to go into that detail. Um, but I think for those that have seen this several times, perhaps that's enough. To get into the product, of course, we um, go through regulated platforms. These are the only um, people or groups that then chat to the investment bank and have the ability to place funds onto the bank and back from the bank. So cash always flows invest to platform, platform to the investment and back again. Clean, lovely, neat and tidy. Um, Cashbox and IDAD, Andrew particularly, and the team at IDAD would then structure, shape, et cetera, create the product. It's up to the investment bank to say, hey, we really like this. They, they then say, yes, we're gonna issue this off our balance sheet. They may change some parameters. And it's them that we actually get as investors a direct contract with, uh, which makes us a fantastic product. Fee light because these platforms are not expensive to run um, is really the structure. So again, um, phenomenal numbers. Um, I'd add doing over 200 structured notes a year for the last five years. They've all, des all performed as designed, coupons paying out, capital return, uh, we trust that's going to be the you know, ongoing forever and ever. Um, and a lot of work, as you can see, goes into shaping these just to make sure that this is the case and we keep doing this. Okay. Good. Questions. You guys have been very quiet. We had like two questions on the chat the whole time. Anybody? Uh, <laughs> All right. I think if I've I got can a question. Just sorry, in. can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Devin. Yeah. Sorry, man. Um, I've, uh, I follow the likes of the Robert Kiyosakis and those guys in the world. And I've seen lately they've had a lot of YouTube videos that they've kind of, and podcasts that they've come out, you know, almost warning people of all these catastrophic crashes that are happening in, like, and they, you know, they, they kind of videos are going from like one month to one week to one day type of thing. Um, you know, and they, you know, they're the property moguls. And you know they they're kind of predicting a massive crash. What are your what are your thoughts on that? And is there any kind of roll-on effect to to the notes, to the structured notes that you guys do? No, Devin, I'll jump in from my side, Graham. You can add your bit. Mm. I think you know mm. there's been a lot of talk. There's been a lot of talk about and there's certain appendages, monikers that have been given. The Great Reset, uh, the, the the unemployment, uh, the Great Unemployment, uh, the the New World Order, um, the fact that the, the, the currencies as we know them will cease to exist. Uh, asset classes will be disruptive. And I mean, I think what we're seeing is really disruptive technologies, disruptive movements in stock markets, economies. They've been happening for quite some time. Um, it's really evolution. It's a change. So the cataclysmic drop that, that some of these guys talk about um, is literally where life as we know it almost ceases, you know, where you have a 1929 situation where the stock market drops, you know, more than, than 60 or 70%. So in other words, it's worthless. I read a, I read a guy, and, and, and I'll answer the question very directly. I, re I read a guy from the Wall Street Journal who is advocating that people should actually be investing at these levels. He says the reason why, he says, if one just takes the war into consideration, he said, the fact that there's a nuclear missile maybe pointing at the West um, is going to cause lots of chaos, lots of mayhem, lots of fear, lots of panic, lots of uneasiness and uncertainty. And it's going to cause markets to wobble and fluctuate and, and, and drop value. Um, but if you invest in them, once this is passed, if there is a past and we a future and we go to that future, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll have done very well in terms of having bought things at a huge premium. If they launch the missile, well, then it doesn't matter what you've got in your portfolio. It's not going to make a difference. It's a bit of a harsh way of looking at it because, you know, you won't exist. Those companies, those countries, those economies won't exist if there's a nuclear war. So that's a bit fatalistic. I think where those guys, what those guys are saying is that the, the bubble that came out of the rubber band um, response to the pandemic, uh, because the markets were overheated in 2019. Um, there was talks about, you know, things were slowing down quite badly. Interest rates were, were talking about interest rates being cut. There was recession, all sorts of things happening. 
I mean, effectively, we're in corrective territory at the moment across most of, and talk about the US now, um, in most of those indices, we're in corrective or bear territory minimum, but most are corrections, uh, which means they're below certainly 10 or 20% plus. So there is massive value if you see it as a glass half empty, uh, sorry, a half, uh, half full store. But certainly um, the, the other side of the coin is that we've looked at countering the fear aspect by launching something like the bank's issue, which came out you know, earlier this month, uh, late last month, uh, which is a completely different note structured around defensive type of sectors and businesses that generally do okay in times of great unease in terms of war, et cetera. So if we have to factor back in inflation, interest rates, blah, blah, um, no free money, the party is over, banks are going to do quite well in that environment. Yeah, that's a proven point. Um, I'm not talking about a cataclysmic atomic war now. I'm talking about just the normalization of, of businesses and economies and the realignment of those. Um, you know, everybody has, uh, there's, been a bit, there's been a big flight to safety in terms of um, commodities. Commodity markets have absolutely boomed. Uh, in terms of precious metals, in terms of ferrous, non-ferrous, the, the, the lab platinum and palladium groups, gold, you name it. There's been, uh, there hasn't been a massive rush to cash, but there's also been a concern about, am I going to be able to buy a new pair of golf clubs or should I be saving for toilet paper? So staple foods, um, that's another sector. That generally, it's a secular sector that does well in terms of its defensive commodity sector, discretionary sector. So, um, I don't think you're going to see, I think across 2022, this is my personal view, but I, I get it from a lot of different sources. I think during 2022, you're going to see a lot of sectors having their time to shine. You know, at the moment, it's the defense sector. If you look what's happening in Northrop, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Electric, um, you know, the guys who are supplying the military industrial complex, their share prices are doing very well. Um, but I think during 2022, there's going to be a lot of sectors that will have their, light to, their time to shine. 2020 was just tech very narrow. Last year, it was the recovery. There were a lot of people saying that the recovery, the leisure industry was going to take off and it never did. Airlines, etc. We're under great threat with energy. We're under great threat with, you know, do we just dump oil now and go electric? It's not that simple. Um, it was transitioning. It was evolving. So a massive drop in terms of a 60 or 70% drop. It didn't happen in the pandemic. Um, Personally, I don't see that happening. I see certain sectors being affected, um, but I don't see a massive overnight crash. Um, and certainly, you know, we've generally got 50% built into most of our, our products. Um, this one has got a slightly less defensive barrier in terms of its final defense, 65%, simply because of the high coupon that the, the, the investors are trying to extract. But I would certainly say you know, 40 to 50% or 35 to 50% as a defense that's contractually built in is worth holding on to as opposed to having an unhedged position in a stock market portfolio. There's a place for it in a portfolio, but certainly that's going to have attrition in terms of you holding the shares on a basis of, if I have to sell them tomorrow, that's what I'm going to get out. That's a big difference. Graham? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree, Andrew. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I mean, we can spend all day really discussing the, mm. uh, the, the the variables and the whys and wherefores, etc. But I mean, I, I look at this, Devon, the, um, you know, the, I, I can look back 50 years. I mean, you can you can look back 100 years, but, you know, look back 50 years. You know, you've got the you got the 70s oil crisis. Um, you have uh, you had the, 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 the issues within the 80s. You had Black Monday. Um, you had uh, you had late 90s. You had the Russian debt crisis. Um, you had the dot-com bubble, um, you know, we moved forward to the credit crunch 2008, nine, um, you know, we, we, we've had COVID, um, you know, what the, 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 the fact is that the investment um, uh, in uh, the investment um, subject matter has, is littered with issues. And, you know, we, every time you look at these dips, you look at these peaks and troughs, you will always see that uh, over, a, over a specific period, and it averages out at round about three years, that uh, wherever you have a major, major catastrophe, um, and, and, you know, look, God forbid, this might be the one, um, but, but, but let's, let's hope that common sense prevails. But, 
you know, the fact of the matter is, wherever there is an issue in, in, the, in the history of the world, the recovery period is less than three years. And then lo and behold, look at the way we structure our notes. The minimum term we normally do is four years. So let's say there is a, a massive, massive correction. We've got a four year period to recover um, and, and recovery always happens. Um, you know, we're human beings. We, we want to survive. We want to regenerate. Um, uh, we want to procreate. Um, you know, we could get all philosophical, but the simple fact of the matter is that as we go forward in the generations, we build, we produce, we develop, we advance. Um, and so therefore, the, and the investment criteria follows the same, um, same process. Um, you know, again, cliche sayings, but it's not timing the market, it's time in the market. Um, and this is what we have here with a structured product note. We have that term. Um, as Chad mentioned, we, we, we position these auto calls such that, you know, we have the ability to be able to exit the note, um, having received a return, to reassess our portfolios, to again get into the market with the, with the, 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 the circumstances that prevail at the time. So it's, it, it, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, um, if we have a correction, yeah, we'll have a correction but we have a recovery period and, and we move forward. And, um, you know, as I say, I'll go back to the point which Andrew has very eloquently covered is that we have three organizations here that, uh, that are absolutely within the key space of their sectors. Um, they're dominant, they're powerful, um, they're constantly, um, uh, you know, learning and uh, developing uh, within their space. And so, therefore, the opportunities are, are considerable, and um, the due diligence that we that we perform is, um, you know, is, is 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 quite phenomenal, really. To 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 think that we pull together baskets, which is demonstrable in the way that Chad said that our performance track record is such that we, you know, we 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 have um, we have a, a, a statistics which basically mean that um, less than three percent of our notes. And we've been, and the, we're now at about uh, nearly 1,800 um, have actually lost any capital at all for, for investors. Um, and that's over a, uh, you know, since 2008. Um, so that's, that's, my, that's my take on it, Devon. So Dave, maybe just from my side, this is a great time to be investing with these levels of insurance, uh, if you like, or protection built in. And what's great is the investment banks looking at this as the opportunity to make money and the window is let's say three years because high, high expectation that the bank's going to order call early and at that stage we've all made money so the beauty of the structured note is we can keep looking at the, at the conditions in the market at this point in time as best we can see it for the coming let's say year year and a half um so a lot of a lot of minds on these Devin. Yeah, cool, great. I uh, appreciate that. Thanks for the expertise, James. Pleasure. Perfect. Great. So just in summary, if there are any more questions, um, if you do want to proceed or move forward and move into one of these notes, you'll just drop us a mail or a message, either to myself or to support at cashbox.global. If you don't have a trading platform, um, let me know. If we can help you with that as well and answer any questions if you've got direct questions that you prefer not to ask on the webinar. So if there's nothing else, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for joining us. And that's it. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. See you Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 B